Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar brought to you by the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at UCLA. I'm Ethan Pack, and I'm a lecturer in the Department of Comparative Literature and with the Nazarian Center. I want to uh, tell you about our talk today. We'll be hearing from Dr. Yael Halavi Weiss, whose presentation is entitled Wrestling with Redemption, A.B. Yehoshua's Retrospective Imagination. I'd like to thank the Nazarian Center's co-sponsors for this event, the UCLA Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies and the UCLA Department of Comparative Literature. Dr. Yael Halevi Weiss is Associate Professor of Literature and Chair of Jewish Studies at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Dr. Halevi Weiss's interests include the theory of the novel, contemporary Israeli literature, 19th century English literature, and 20th century Latin American literature. She received her PhD from Princeton, and before coming to Montreal, she also taught at Brandeis, Cornell, and Princeton universities. Dr. Halevi Weiss is the author of many journal articles in several books, including Sephardism, Spanish Jewish History, and the Modern Literary Imagination from 2012, and Interactive Fictions, Scenes of Storytelling in the Novel from 2003. Today, she will speak about her most recent book, the Retrospective Imagination of A.B. Yehoshua, published in 2020 from Penn State University Press. This book explores the work of the internationally recognized novelist, A.B. Yehoshua, whom the New York Times has called the Israeli Faulkner. As many of you know, Yehoshua is not only an acclaimed novelist, but one of the most prominent public intellectuals in Israel. Israel in the sense is unlike the US in that the role of literary authors is not something only discussed in university seminars. One can hear debate about Yehoshua and his viewpoints in nearly any setting in Israel, from a public bus to the television news at night. But as Dr. Halevi Weiss points out in her book, Yehoshua's prominence rests on his remarkable literary achievements. Uh, Dr. Halevi Weiss's study spans over six decades of Yehoshua's career, and personally, as a scholar in the field of Hebrew literature, I should say we are very fortunate that she has produced this impressive study insofar as most work on Yehoshua in English up to this point has focused on specific books and not on the totality of his uh, impressive career. Before I turn it over to Dr. Halevi Weiss, I just want to mention that after her presentation, there will be a question and answer period. Please type your questions into the chat and then during the q and I will convey these questions to Dr. Halavi Weiss, who I know will be eager to answer them. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Yael Halavi Weiss. Thank you, thank you very much, Ethan. And thanks also to Dove Waxman, to Mora, and to Jeff. I, I wanna say that throughout the pandemic, I've been particularly enjoying uh, the, the programming from the Nazarian Center. And uh, so very, very glad to be able to join uh, this group of conversations. Um, I would like to start from the premise that most of you are aware that the Israeli writer, Abi Yoshua, um, as, as, as Ethan uh, was, uh, was uh, starting to say, uh, in his fictional works, as well as in his public lectures and interviews, is deeply invested in a process of clarifying Israeli identity in relation to evolving circumstances in the present, and also in relation to core concepts and attitudes of Jewish identity that go back to ancient times. Yeshua uh, often comes up to the podium a bit uh, like those frustrated prophets of yore, and he exhorts Jews as well as Gentiles to clarify our separate and overlapping identities. Uh, in particular, he's interested in clarifying them in light of the evolving reality of the state of Israel. But always he does this in a deeply historicized and even uh, comparative manner that reaches out to consider other alternative national situations 
uh, in different periods and different locations. And that's why uh, uh, we can say that he has a retrospective imagination. Uh, given now uh, the restitution, a truly extraordinary restitution of Jewish sovereignty in modern times. Yeshua asks whether this modern reestablishment of full political responsibilities is adequately supported by a necessary concomitant readjustment of old attitudes towards self and other among all the people involved that uh, is Israelis, including Arab Israelis and their Palestinian counterparts, uh, Jews in Israel versus Jews living abroad, and many different types of Jews, um, Sephardim, Ashkenazim, religious, secular, all these ingathered uh, semi-comfortable alliances that have been leading uh, to four national elections as we see in uh, recent months. Yoshua worries whether this extraordinary renewal of sovereign Jewish life could weaken or even crumble in the face of the considerable difficulties that beset it from within and without. He especially resents what he views as a dangerous tendency that he ascribes uh, specifically to the Jewish people in a kind of warbled Freudian way, and I've debated this with him, uh, but to no avail, where he as allegedly ascribes to Jews more than others, a supposed tendency to flee uh, or to cling to a diasporic lifestyle instead of fully committing to a necessary process of national and personal renewal and reformation within the homeland. It is from uh, that point of view that he can claim that diasporic Jews are playing with Judaism while Israelis, including Israeli Arabs uh, and avowed atheists like himself, are married to Judaism. We will return uh, to this metaphor. This will be the main metaphor around which I'm uh, weaving my, my talk. Since I happen to be a scholar of comparative literature with a particular love uh, for complex literary productions, I will proceed uh, to talk not, a, not uh, really about the historical political situation, but rather I wanna show you how Yoshua packs uh, this type of historiosophic arguments into his fictional worlds, into the structure of his novels. I want to show you how he invites us to evaluate the concept, uh, in this case, uh, be focusing on the concept of redemption, geula, uh, which is national and personal redemption and repair. And I'll show you how he does that in his first full-fledged novel, Hamiahev, The Lover, which he composed in the mid uh, 1970s after the Yom Kippur War. So uh, in 1977, uh, when this novel came out, Yoshua was already very well known, uh, both in Israel and abroad, as a writer of uh, gripping short stories and provocative novellas uh, with an existential flavor. He was happily married to a clinic to a clinical psychologist. They have three children, and he was supporting himself primarily as a profession, uh, as a professor of Hebrew and comparative literature at the University of Haifa. So he was teaching literature. At this point, uh, in his early 40s, having trained himself to write short works uh, and having carefully studied uh, literary giants like Faulkner and Agnon, he felt ready to throw down a heavier gauntlet and intervene uh, artistically and ideologically at a time of acute social and political turmoil 
uh, after the, the mess of the Yom Kippur War. So the cast of characters in this full-fledged uh, first novel, The Lover, is not large. And that's uh, uh, part of the reason why I choose this to, to show uh, how he, he, he has this multi-dimensional uh, uh, levels of signification. Uh, we have six main characters re that revolve around a nuclear family of three, including Adam, his wife, Asya, and their rebellious uh, teenage daughter, Daffy, uh, who is 16 years old. Three other main characters come into contact with them in a sort of, uh, becomes a sort of extended family. There's Gabriel Arditi, a young expatriate who has suddenly returned to Haifa from his uh, sort of hideout in Paris because he thinks he's about to inherit a car. Uh, this old little Morris uh, kind of uh, make of car and an apartment from his dying old grandmother. Uh, she's in a coma and then uh, she brilliantly wakes up. There's the grandmother herself, Vidu Hermoso, a representative of the old yeshuv in Jerusalem of the Sephardic communities that go back uh, many generations. And, and Yoshua uh, uh, from his father's side comes from that uh, 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 social group. And uh, the Arab teenager Naim, whose father has pulled him out of school and has sent him to work as a mechanic in Adam's garage uh, and who falls in love with Daffy. Now, keep in mind, uh, in addition, that Adam and Asia are a bereaved couple because Daffy's older brother, Yigal, had been killed in an accident when he was uh, five years old. And in any case, even before that tragedy, the attachment between Asia and Adam was never so very uh, strong and healthy. So all this uh, to be sure sounds tragic and pathetic, but as you know, if you've read any of Yeshua's works, it's actually tragic comic and absurd. So let me uh, just read to you the opening uh, gambit of this novel. And this is from the novel each it's all told from the point of view of those six characters. They, they come in in, in a Faulknerian uh, uh, fragmentation of consciousness and they tell their, their story, their inner life. So this is from Adam. And in the last war, we lost a lover. We used to have a lover. And since the war, he's gone, just disappeared he and his grandmother's old Morris. And more than six months have passed and there has been no sign from him. We're always saying it's a small, intimate country. If you try hard enough, you'll discover links between the most distant people. And now it's as if the man has been swallowed up by the earth, disappeared without trace, and all the searches have been fruitless. If I were sure he had been killed, I would give up the search. What right have we to be stubborn about a dead lover? There are some people who have lost all that is dear, sons, fathers, husbands. But how can I put it? Still, I'm convinced that he hasn't been killed. Not him. I'm sure he never even reached the front. And even if he was killed, Where's the car? Where has that disappeared to? You can't just hide a car in the sand. There was a war. That's right. It came upon us a complete surprise. Again and again, I read the confused accounts of what happened, trying to get to the bottom of the chaos that ruled then. So what is going on here? How can we collectively have or lose a lover? 
on the basic level of the plot, what Bible uh, scholars call the pshat, the first simplest direct uh, understanding of the text. This man, Adam, is scouring the country to find his wife's AWOL lover. That troubled young man, Gabriel Arditi, who Adam himself had brought for us. Yeah, uh, first ostensibly to help her with some French translation uh, for her PhD dissertation, but really hoping to rekindle his uh, desire for her vicariously. Adam is not looking for the wife's lover to kill him, but rather to bring him back to the bosom of the family so that this stranger might help put together what has fallen apart. Gradually, it emerges, however, that in this uh, novel called The Lover, there's more than one lover. The Arab teenager, Naim, falls in love with Duffy and becomes her lover. Adam has illicit sexual relations with Duffy's classmate. Uh, while in his own matrimonial bed, he's an absent lover. And there's another classmate uh, of Daffy's, a boy called Yigal Rabinovich, who is waiting, uh, perhaps uh, is in love with her, and he would like to, to become a lover. This proliferation of lovers and potential lovers invites us to take a closer look at the concept itself. What is a lover in contrast to a spouse, a stranger, or a mere acquaintance. Whose lover is it? Even if Gabriel is the main lover here, does he actually love anyone at all? In other words, what kind of fire is Yoshua playing with here? Well, you might recall uh, the ancient Midrashic rabbinic interpretations of historical events and texts, particularly after the fall of the first temple, where the concept of a lover is applied both to the people and to the God of Israel. We especially see this in the Midrashic commentaries to the Song of Songs. Notably, uh, this is the most erotic segment of the Bible, which after the fall of the temple gets interpreted as an allegory about a stressed relationship between God and the people of Israel who are not getting along very well, uh, you know, understatement, and are temporarily pulled asunder. So the idea of God as a lover seeps, uh, among other areas, into Kabbalistic discourse which is even more heavily sexualized and allegorized. Uh, and uh, it goes back uh, all the way to the angry prophets, Amos, and especially Jeremiah, who described the people of Israel and Judea as a wayward wife who had reneged on her covenant with the God of Sinai. And therefore the divine husband is now upset, threatening divorce, abandonment and imminent destruction, which uh, when it does come from the side of Assyrio-Babylonia uh, in 587 before the common era is subsequently lamented in the Book of Lamentations, Echa, through more of these troubled marriage metaphors. So this is, this lover uh, trope goes very back, way back. Let's zip forward uh, to the modern Hebrew novel, especially the examples of Shai Agnon, the first Hebrew Nobel Prize winner in the category of literature. Agnon was among those who reconfigured such ominous traditional metaphors of marital strife into a more optimistic endorsement of personal repair and national return to the historic homeland. He synthesized Jewish lore with modern psychological realism. And Yoshua, to return to our subject, learns from Agnon very deliberately 
to see how to join Jewish themes with Western literary forms, how to make these themes relevant to a universal readership, and how to adapt modern literary devices into complex, multifaceted play with loaded historiosophic concepts such as redemption or uh, God as an absent lover. More systematically than any novelist I know, Dickens, Tolstoy, Faulkner, Wolf, even Joyce, uh, as well as I've known himself, Yoshua, from the lover onward, began to compose his novels on four levels of signification. You can uh, try to visualize this as a house, not uh, the house of fiction that Henry James described, you know, where every character uh, glances at the world from a different window pane and sees a different intersecting uh, sliver of reality. There's definitely that here too. It applies very strongly to Joshua's Faulknerian uh, fragmentation of points of view in The Lover and in other uh, novels. Uh, but um, rather I'm thinking of a house of fiction that has a basement, an attic, uh, gardens and wings where the main action takes place on the main floor and the realistic socio-political context is represented in the wings and uh, the garden around the house. In the basement we are privy to painful half-conscious psychological tensions in the minds of the characters and in the attic which can be accessed through elusive hints, staircases, and special elevators, we can join a historiosophic conversation about Jewish history and identity that I am uh, emphasizing today in my analysis. Uh, so all of this happens in all of these novels in different ways, different concepts, different different things going on in each of those areas of the house. Each one is a different house. In the novel uh, that we're talking about, The Lover, you can clearly see psychological strife of the six characters whose minds are presented through the Faulknerian fragmentation of consciousness, uh, that different, uh, same event, different, uh, points of view, you can see a very interesting sociopolitical socio representation of Israeli society that is clustered mainly um, around Adam's uh, workplace, the Kare repair garage, where he employs uh, mainly Arabs from a nearby village. And we also see the sociopolitical historical representation through Adam's wife, who's a teacher and insists on a labor Zionist socialist mentality uh, that has evidently gone stale on her uh, along with her marriage. In other words, the workplace and the family function here as a microcosm of the nation. From a historical point of view, we saw that the novel is situated in the immediate aftermath of the 1973 War of Yom Kippur, but it also sweeps back at a longer background through the dying grandmother who had grown up among Arabs and Sfaradim and Ashkenazim in Jerusalem of the old Yishuv prior to the rise of modern uh, Zionism. And uh, she lost her daughter in the War of 48. So she moved to Haifa. On top and strong through this, and this all, we have um, the historiosophic dimension that goes back even further to the blurriness of traditional myths that engage with notions of Jewish identity and that have formed part of an ongoing conception of self and world among Jews and others since ancient times. You uh, may have already noticed that some of the names that Yoshua assigns to his characters, Adam, Asya, Naim, are somewhat allegorical. Naim 
is a common Arab name. It uh, also means pleasant in Hebrew. Uh, so, so this is the positive attitude uh, that uh, Yeshua wants to underscore toward Naim. But what does it mean that an Adam, an Israeli everyman, cannot communicate with his wife, Asya? Are he and Asya not compatible enough? And um, I'm especially interested in the name of a character uh, called Yigal, which means uh, redemptor. Uh, this character is not given a voice and uh, does not have an actual presence in the present of the plot, but he occupies the conceptual center that radiates from the works attic, if you will, and um, ironically sets in motion uh, uh, the whole, uh, um, you know, conceptual discussion into which Yoshua invites us. So uh, this is uh, the dead little boy uh, who was born deaf to Adam and Asya who gets run over by a car when he was five years old and leaves a permanent sense of instability in the family. Around this absence, around this loss of the little boy, Igal, Yoshua organizes uh, the novel. After Igal's death, Adam begs Asya to make a replacement child and uh, he gets Duffy. Gabriel Arditi, the absconded lover, figures uh, very explicitly in the novel as a replacement, another replacement for the lost Igal. So Asya is uh, always presented in, in this novel through her dreams. And in one of her many dreams about her lover, she realizes, um, she realizes that this wasn't Igal, but some kind of replacement that Adam brought for me. So wonderful and right to bring me a substitute. In, in Hebrew, Yeshua used the word tachlif, um, and he even, tachlif, a substitute replacement, he even encircle, encircles tachlif in quotation marks to highlight the problematic link between the lover, Gabriel, and uh, Igal, the missing child. As if all this were not uh, overdetermined enough, when Daffy first meets Naim, who later, as I said, becomes her lover, she notices that Naim looks like Igal, and she wants to share this discovery with her parents, but she then says to herself, oh, they're just going to say, what do you know? You never saw Igal. Um, in fact, Adam, her father, had noticed a resemblance between Naim and Igal, as well as between Gabriel and, uh, and, and Igal. Um, and this is emphasized in two occasions where they get injured. Uh, Gabriel enters Adam's life when he wheels in the decrepit old car into the garage. He says it has a screw missing, and then he faints in the garage from hunger. And, and, and Adam says, it's not the first time I've seen uh, a, a young creature collapsing. Uh, and and uh, at another point, Naim is tightening brakes under a car. He gets injured. Um, in his head, there's a lot of blood, and and Adam rushes and he says, "It's not the first time I've seen a boy lying in a pool of blood." Uh, but in all of these occasions, it's also specifically uh, shown by Joshua that he connects it to Egal. So, in other words, there's this complex and very deliberate network of substitutions that revolve around the missing Igal. Why? 
Uh, we don't have uh, enough time uh, today to discuss the academic implications of uh, this illusion in a way that recurs throughout Yeshua's career in connection to the story uh, from Genesis about Abraham's binding and near sacrifice of Isaac. This is a theme that recurs uh, not only across Yoshua's works, as the literary critic Mordechai Shalev uh, first uh, pointed out, but it's a theme that recurs, uh, Yair Feldman has shown throughout uh, uh, modern Hebrew literature and uh, in other literatures as well. Uh, in the time that we have left, I just want to illum illuminate from you this, uh, for you, uh, this metaphor. Uh, of Geula, of redemption, from its historical and historiosophical dimensions in the novel. The name itself, Yigal, emerged in the 1920s among Hebrew-speaking Zionist pioneers. It means, uh, it's a biblical word, it means redeemer, or to be redeemed, you know, depending on Yigael, Yigal, where you uh, put the vowels. Anita Shapira, in her biography of the statesman uh, who died very young, Yigal Alon, relates that in the aftermath of the Balfour Declaration, Yigal Alon's father, a farmer in the Galilee, decided that he wanted, um, and I quote from Anita's book, he wanted no more dispirited diaspora names, no more Moshe's and Mordechai's. Yigal, the Redeemer, suggested new times, a different sort of life experience, high hopes, and a commensurate self-confidence. By the time that Joshua chooses the name Yigal for Adam and Asias, lost, firstborn, the name has become so common and so trendy that it has completely lost all those um, heady connotations. So Yoshua in his provocative manner, so subtle in his novels, so blunt in his first, uh, personal uh, remarks, in his frontal personal remarks, reminds us here of those hopeful times and contrasts them with the post-Kippur aftermath. He obviously uses the name ironically to draw attention to the yawn between the hope encoded in the modern Zionist name, a moral and practical idea of rescue and redemption, and the series of mistakes that had led to the loss of Adam and Asia's child and their subsequent frantic change chases after any number of substitutes instead of working on their core relationship, uh, shoring up their family, figuring out how to be re more responsible for their extended dependence, all those vulnerable people that congregate around them. In the 1970s, during the political and ideological realignment that followed the Yom Kippur War, and in the face of new psychological, sociopolitical, and existential tribulations and inequities, Yoshua reminds his reader to stop and reconsider the relevance of redemption at that time scaled down to the fictional world of his novel, we see that Adam obsessively searching for the elusive lover is deluded. We realize we want to say to him, enough, why don't you try to repair your relationship with your wife? Why don't you concentrate on Asia, on your Daffy, on Naim, and the abandoned grandmother of Viducha stop running after this prodigal lover who won't commit to the enterprise of reconstruction and repair. A few years after Yoshua came out with this novel, the singer uh, Shalom Hanoch composed a song that became very popular at that time in 1980s, Mashiach. Mashiach, also another term for the Redeemer. The chorus goes something like, uh, Mashiach Loba, 
Mashiach gam lo metalfen. Right, so this Messiah isn't coming. He isn't even phoning. The figure of the dead little run over child, Yigal, that Yoshua plants at the center of his first full fledged novel. A dynamic uh, that repeats itself in different ways with different themes in all his subsequent novels quietly invites us into a dialogue about the validity of ancient concepts that continue to inform Jewish history and identity in our present times. His strength as a fabulist and as an intellectual is this scaling down of key concepts to the level of existential problems in his characters' minds, in sexual relationships between the couples, in their family dynamics, the sociopolitical tensions that are drawn, especially around the workplace, such as Adam's garage here, and over and above, Yeshua pulls us into a fresh dialogue with the history of the Jewish people and their identity crisis at key junctures of time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Halavi Weiss. That was such a fascinating presentation and um, really an amazing through line to Yehoshua's work going back to this, this first novel. And it is interesting that 77, it's the year it's published, the year of the revolution where the Likud uh, wins the election for the first time. And in some ways, you could say that all these elections since then are, you know, do-overs from 77, kind of uh, the, the new dynamics that were enshrined at that time. Um, so I'm going to start, I just have uh, one or two questions that I'll ask to get the discussion going, and then I'll turn and start um, uh, pulling in questions from the Q&A. And so uh, one of my first questions is going to be, there seems to be uh, this um, contradiction, maybe not a contradiction, that Yehoshua on the one hand is so invested in the project of Jewish sovereignty. And you mentioned this, this famous comment he gave at the American Jewish uh, Congress where he said that in the diaspora they're just playing with Judaism. Um, so he, he, his, he, as, uh, as a public figure, he has a very clear preference for the project of, of sovereignty. And yet, typically, today we think of um, pluralism and other identities getting along with each other as the alternative to sovereignty, that sovereignty is this kind of narrow ethnocentric thing. And, the, and anyone interested in um, uh, getting along has to kind of leave sovereignty behind and uh, and go back to some sort of diasporic, you know, pluralist world of, of different groups living side by side. So how does Yehoshua, that's obviously not how he sees it. So how does he see sovereignty mixing with what you emphasize throughout the book of these different characters in different identities having to get along with one another? <laughs> so there's a short and an intermediate and a long answer. <laughs> Um, the short answer is that like uh, Ben Gurion, we just heard from Tom Segev last uh, week, he, he believes that sovereignty is the solution for Jewish uh, existential problems for the Jewish question. That's uh, Zionism 101. Um, the intermediate answer is that he believes and he said so in, 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 in several uh, essays, he believes that nation states are the most efficient uh, way to organize people, the way that a family mm -hmm. is a, a, um, you know, a, a cellular organism in society. And he believes that the that even though there might be many divorces and different types of families emerging, still the family is the nuclear uh, glue of the larger society. And he believes that national bodies 
are uh, the way to best organize people around the globe. We see it, for instance, now in the pandemic, all of a sudden the borders and the nations have become uh, much more uh, relevant. The longer explanation that I would give you is that our very idea of nationhood in the West is predicated on readings and misreadings of the Bible, mm -hmm. of the people of Israel. And so there is a kind of conception of Am Yisrael, of the nation of Israel, that informs the very idea of modern nationalism in a way that is very complicated, confused, and not very uh, healthy for any of us. So this is a great question, and it's one that uh, needs a lot of thinking through. Thank you so much. I'm going to draw, um, I, have, I have other questions, but plenty of them. Um, I'll start to draw these questions from the Q&A, and then if there's time, get back to uh, one of my own questions. But so um, in the Q&A, a few people have asked, and it kind of follows up from this, about Yehoshua's Sephardi identity, you know, so his family had been living in Jerusalem since, you know, I think the 19th century. And, um, and, you know, at the same time, he's interested in putting Sephardim next to Ashkenazim, next to, in this case, um, one of the replacement sons could be this, uh, uh, you know, uh, Arab Palestinian young man. What is the significance in all this of his Sephardi background and, you know, does it, 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 does it constitute somehow some, something more Israeli or more authentic than the other groups? Or how does he see the Sephardi entity getting along with the other entities in this, in this larger Israeli uh, story? Yeah. So his Sephardic background is both very important and not important at all. It's very important because this kind of uh, not fully in the center position um, a a allowed him uh, to see certain things that that you know Ashkenazim or somebody from Poland who had come to Israel in recent times could not see. Now this Faradim of Jerusalem were also people who interacted very very closely with the Arabs and with the Ottoman. Uh, empire that 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 ruled uh, uh, the the area, um, and um, they also interacted with the Ashkenazi Jews and so forth. So they're kind of they're mediators, and it's uh, unfortunate they were not given more of a chance to mediate uh, early on. Um, but Yoshua is not interested in in any kind of. Sephardic supremacy in Shas and uh, is not interested in, this, uh, in, 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 in any kind of ethnic division, but rather in looking at the interface between all the different ethnicities, religions, nationalities, is interested in the glue in the interface so that they can respect each other's differences, but also but also figure out where they can come together. And so that's why he emphasizes an Israeli identity within clearly defined borders and between Israelis and the world. It's, it's, and it is such a contrast, perhaps now more than ever with uh, in, in the, you know, the current dynamic, they talk about each uh, the Shvatim, the tribes. So the ultra-Orthodox are a tribe the Palestinians are a tribe, the secular are a tribe, and each one kind of competing to be the authentic and in some ways, like you say, supreme uh, supremacist, you know, power holder. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's hard to think about a, a, a model because it's you know, been so long <laughs> since this was uh, more of an option in the public of um, like a pluralist uh, sense. And so, um, it, uh, drawing on, um, again, going back to the different identities, he, as you mentioned, is you know dedicated uh, secular person. And one of our questioners asks, if he is, you know, you're given that he's so secular, why uh, 
does he use so much Jewish religious symbolism and biblical symbolism? Um, and, you know, yeah, how does that relate to all this? Uh huh. Um, I have a chapter in my book on holidays, on his very, very extensive use of holidays as the background uh, of many of his novels. And he goes very deeply into the significance of all the holidays, including uh, the day of rest, Shabbat. Uh, he is familiar with the Talmud, is very familiar with the Bible. Um, and he always goes around saying that he's an atheist. But he also says that God is too important to be left to the religious. And that religion is too important to be left to the religion, to the religious. He recognizes that people believe in God and they will continue to believe in God and that God is an entity that plays a role whether it's the absent lover or whatever, it forms part also of our identity as, as Jews and, and, and anybody. And so he's not the kind of secular who says, ah, uh, and soon there's gonna be progress and everybody's gonna be atheists like me and whatever, but he love each other supposedly. No, so he confronts this, takes it by the horns and invites us to, um, to wrestle with the role of God in, uh, and, and, yeah, and Agnon did it too, uh, for modern uh, Jews and for uh, Israel. Um, here, I can read to you something from one of his novels, uh, where the character Tr Trigano uh, who is, uh, he, 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 it doesn't matter. He, he's arguing with some other character and, and, and Trigano says, he's arguing with another character called Moses. And Trigano says, uh, I don't wanna attack religion as such, the ritual and prayers, all that small stuff, which do no harm, as long as they give people comfort or provide structure for anxious souls. Mm -hmm. But those souls must not be dragged into the fear of something hidden and invisible, of a God who is abstract, jealous, and aggressive. If I was incapable of destroying that supremacy, I could at least play tricks on it, make it hazy, mock it, put it to sleep, expose its weakness, its instability, inject into it elements that contradict its holiness, pagan, absurd elements because hedonistic secular culture is basically a thin brittle crust that at a time of crisis or conflict crumbles before the terrifying power of transcendence. Wow. So this is in, 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 in one of the novels, but uh, I think in some ways it reflects Yeshua's attitude towards religion and God. Uh, which novel is that from? It's in uh, Chesed Sfaradi. No mm. coincidence that it has to do with this Sephardic trope, uh, which has uh, been translated the title in English. They gave it, it's supposed to be Spanish charity, mm. but they changed the title to retrospective. Mm. Thank, thank you, yeah. Um, and so I, I would ask, there's a few questions like this, but I'm gonna merge them and, and ask about, so what does, you know, obviously uh, Yoshua takes the religious tradition very seriously. And I think this is one of the misconceptions that happens from um, Jews abroad about, about uh, so-called secular non-religious Jews in Israel is that they don't take their tradition seriously. And whereas in fact, Yoshua says the opposite. He says, we're the only ones, uh, take, we take this much more seriously than you do. Uh, uh, and he has a different definition of what, taking it seriously means perhaps. And so um, what in his view does this new project of, of, like you say, the restitution of Jewish sovereignty, uh, other um, formulations are like the new Jew, what does this add to the tradition that you know, is not available in the diaspora in Yehoshua's view? Mm -hmm. And it's a big question. 
Yeah. Well, well I, I guess it is, it, it, it is a question that he asks. What has changed? What is new over here? So the, these Jews have returned, whether you like it or not, they're there, they have established uh, this, this state. Um, in many ways, amazing accomplishments, in many ways, problematic uh, things that have to be worked out. Uh, and so how, how are things different now? for Jewish tradition, for Jewish uh, identity. And that's what he would like to, to take Israeli identity and subsume Jewish identity to it so that we return to the concept of the people of Israel. And that of course put creates a conflict with the, with the presence of Israelis who are not Jewish, but they be, and so he works that out, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the, the people of Israel, uh, it means the Jews, but it, since ancient times, but it also means the citizens. And you know, this is all a Pandora box and a can of worms. Uh, but for instance, I grew up in Mexico among Catholics and um, very few Jews in that city where I grew up, Puebla. And my mother's friend would say, don't go around because I was born in Israel and I was very proud of being Jewish and Israeli. And with a name like Yael, they always say, what kind of name is that? Where are you from? And I would say I'm Jewish, then I would sometimes get questions like, uh, oh, so you don't believe in God? I would say, well, you know, we believe in what you consider the God Father, then they were happy about that. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, one, one friend of my mother said to me, don't go around telling people que eres judía, that you're Jewish. Say Israelita. <laughs> you know, that had less uh, terrible connotations. Mm. But I just said, you know, whatever. I keep saying what I what I, what I believe that I am, and Yoshua underscores that point. Today, the 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 the, the stigma has shifted. They say, don't say you're Israeli. <laughs> say you're, you know. So Yoshua is is really working with those labels and uh, asking us to redefine them, to remember where they come from and what do they mean. What have they meant? And what do we want them to mean? And how can we change our lives and society to live up to um, good standards? Yeah, and there's a lot of what did everyone hope it would mean, which it didn't, you know, which then maybe sharpens the question of what it, what it can mean. Um, there's a, there's a, a few questions about specific works. And so, uh, and one in particular, Marmani, Mr. Mani, which is maybe you could say the, the magnum opus of, of um, Yehoshua's career. Um, and so uh, one qu uh, question from the audience is how our understanding of that novel has changed uh, since it was published. Um, and another question uh, along the same lines is, um, you know, how the themes that you're identifying in the lover, uh, do those re reoccur in Mr. Mani or have, you know, does it, ch do those themes change by the time he writes Mr. Mani, uh, which I think was the late eighties or early nineties, yeah, you'll know, of course. The... I wish I could turn that question back to the audience and the people who asked it to ask them how their, uh, ask you how your understanding of the lover has changed if you've read it, uh, you know, when it first came out in uh, 1989 and English 1990, um, how if you've read it or taught it uh, again, uh, uh, how has your understanding changed um, in terms of whether the kind of 
structures and issues that I pointed out in the lover where they can be found also in Mr. Mani. Mr. Mani is really, really complex, right? Yeah. It's more like five novels strung together into one. So it's very hard to find a center of gravity such as we can in the lover and a conceptual center of gravity. Um, also, the whole point of a fragmentation of languages, and it's like told in five different languages, um, all in Hebrew, <laughs> and and um, um, and and of times, it's five different historical periods. All that fragmentation is 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 to put that fragmentation up and sent up front and center and said and say okay so like what now again how do you create a cohesive identity uh, or not out of that uh, uh, out of that fragmentation but when i thought about this conceptual center of gravity whether my money has it i i i i figured out that, okay, so I have to backtrack a bit. I asked myself, does Yoshua have a defining chronotope, a sort of trope, a place that, that uh, signifies a certain particular uh, situation in the way that Bartin uh, talks about Dostoevsky the threshold, he says the, for Dostoevsky, the distinctive chronotope is the threshold. The characters at key moments, they stand at a threshold, a window, a door, etc., and they have to decide. You go in or out, you do that, and it's from the self and the other and the world. I said, does Yoshua have such a thing? In the picaresque novel, the, the main chronotope is the road. If there isn't that kind of being thrown out on the road again, it's not a picaresque novel. Okay, so does Yoshua have a, a chronotope? And I uh, concluded that his chronotope is that he situates characters at a high point, at a kind of observation point. Physically, it's a, it's a scenario, yeah? If you were filming this, they're physically there. Usually it's a high point. And from there, they're surveying the horizon. Now, if you're familiar with this novella, Facing the Fires, Facing the Forest, yeah. you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But that recurs everywhere. And, and I gave many examples. In the case of Mr. Mani, I wasn't sure. But I realized that there is a point um, in the outskirts of Jerusalem on the road that links to Jerusalem, which is high up on the hill, to Yaffa, uh, I should go like, <laughs> Jerusalem is high up on the hill here in Yaffa to the west uh, on the coast. Uh, on the road there near Jerusalem, there is a point where the characters go in different time periods of Mr. Mani, different characters, different uh, situations. And that's where they have to decide whether to leave or to go up to the city on the hill. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the conceptual center of gravity of Mr. Mani. Oh, well, that, that's remarkable. And, and in, the, in, in your book, I really liked the, the, the theme of the watchman, the Tzofel, uh, the Beit Yisrael, which, you know, from, um, a, what, it's, is it uh, Jeremiah originally? Um, from the prophets who the watchmen of the house of Israel. Um, and, and used to looking at that in terms of the Hebrew poets, uh, the labor Zionist poets, but, but that uh, you, you really show how Yehoshua has that figure in, in, every, in every work. Um, I think and, it's from Ezekiel. Oh, it's from Ezekiel, okay. Actually, but yeah. for others as well. Yeah. The, the watchmen. Um, and um, another question about a specific book, and this is interesting because you talk about this in your first chapter, um, in the tunnel, uh, this the someone asks, in the context of what you've been saying about identity, what do you think is the meaning of the killing of the deer? Which so there's this key character named Tzvi, and, uh, and there's a epithet for the land of Israel, Eretz Tzvi, 
and then um, Land of the Deer, and, uh, and, and then a deer is shot in a very dramatic way in the novel that, that you discuss. So if, uh, you know, I don't know if there's a way to answer that for also the people who haven't read it, who will be able to like uh, glean some, some greater significance to that, which I think you, you touched on in, in your book. Uh, it's, it's horrible. Uh, it's the most tragic uh, moment uh, in all of Yoshua's fiction, in my opinion. Uh, there's nothing uh, tragic comic there. It's simply horrible because this man Tzvi um, has led a good life, an upright life, you know, always. He's now old, he's starting, he has Alzheimer's, he's forgetting everything, including his name. And he is a road engineer. Uh, and for some reason he gets pulled into helping this Palestinian fugitive who is hiding uh, from, hi he's hiding because he sold some land that did not belong to him. So everybody in his village is very upset at him. So he's hiding on top of these Nabataean uh, ruins and the retired road engineer is helping to, him to hide there. And he, he, he goes there in the Negev to, to, to check things out again. And he, he, and he forgets his name. Uh, and that's where that's the scene where uh, the, 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 this Palestinian man uh, pulls out this very weird gun and, and you know says, "Ah, look, it's Svi." And he's a Hebrew teacher, the Palestinian was. He says, "It's Svi, Svi is, is that's the name. Svi means deer." Uh, and it's one of the biblical names of the land, Eretz uh, Tzvi. It's a common name. Uh, it's my husband's middle name, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, it's, oh, look, there's this Tzvi. And, uh, and he pulls out the gun and he shoots the Tzvi. And that's when uh, the man, the character Tzvi, uh, remembers his name. Oh, yeah, I'm Tzvi. So this is, it's, it's horrible. It's, a, it's like a dead end. Where is the cooperation? Where is the, where is the, it's very, it's the most pessimistic scene in Yoshua's uh, whole life work. Wow, yeah, very vulnerable image also of the, of, of the land. And um, so yeah, I wanted to ask you, know, we, we've been talking about so many different and you know, metaphors and, and uh, allusions to, to, to the Bible and to the Jewish tradition. And, but as you discuss in your book, there's, it's not a one for one, a lot of these things. There's a lot of, as you say, uh, layers of signification that aren't self-evident or easy to explain. And so I, I'll kind of uh, tell a, sh a, a short little story. So you, you also mentioned in your book how incredibly generous Yehoshua is with his time as a person. And an example, when I was, I was like not even in graduate school yet, I was kind of freelance journalist after undergrad. And I was trying to write an article about the difference between Israeli authors and American authors. And so I'm nobody. And Yehoshua got on an hour Skype conversation with me and basically talked to me uh, for as long as I wanted to talk to him about these questions, which is just, you know, unbelievably generous. And at the time, you know, there was quite a contrast where him and Amos Oz and David Grossman, his close friends were, you know, the public still turning to them on a certain level to hear what they have to say about, you know, the war in Lebanon or the war in Gaza or, or, or what have you. And in American literature today, I think it's just happening now that American society is waking up to, the, to, to realize that our lives are also very political. Um, and politicized. And so naturally, as everything, as, uh, everything in America has now kind of taken on that level of political intensity that in Israel is like a given, many are, are expecting authors in America to, to weigh in and in, in, um, in sometimes through their fiction. And the thing that I, I just personally, uh, critically, I find that the American authors have 
failed to do that Yehoshua does marvelously is to address the political situation, but not with a sort of simplistic one-to-one, -one, like this character is this viewpoint, and this is the viewpoint that you should have, and it's pedantic and, and everything like that, that Yehoshua is, like you say, always invested in the condition of Israeli life, but he manages to, I don't even say to camouflage, because he's not really advancing one viewpoint in, in the novels. He's rather layering these different viewpoints. So how do you, um, do you think that uh, this is still uh, maybe a defining feature of Israeli literature that other authors have taken from Yehoshua? Um, or, or is this complexity something unique to him as an author that is kind of, I hate to say, but like when he goes, it will be gone or something, you know? Yeah. Um, so there's two sides to this question. First of all, within Israel, I do believe that Yeshua in some ways is the trailblazer um, because when he said, I'm learning for, from Agnon, when Agnon was not highly regarded, all of a sudden they're all piping up. I'm also learning from Agnon. I'm also friends. With, and many, I can give you many examples like that. Um, he is always generous. He has not been competitive with the other uh, writers, but rather he always talks about them as a collective and he, in that way he empowers himself together with them. That's his, his personality. I think that in some ways it also comes from that Sephardic background. I'm not, you know, it's not, it's a big stereotype, but there is that kind of tendency to cooperate rather than push anybody down. Um, uh, Agnon also was a very public figure. You know, he wrote all the time, you know, kind of opinion pieces and autobiographical pieces and was very involved. He was personal friends. They're all personal friends with, with a whole bunch of, um, well, now not so much because the, the, the writers are not from, the writers are all usually from the left. <laughs> the, the right is in government, so they're not personal friends. But when, when the left was in government, there were many ties. Um, uh, they know they met uh, all the great statements and so forth. Um, so it, it will this. I think I think is, Israelis will always continue to be very interested in the writers. It's not just the Jewish writers. Uh, you you see. Uh, uh, um, also with the uh, with the Muslim and Christian Israeli writers, uh, they, they're very interested in their works too, and the, the TV programs, etc. So the culture there is 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 uh, people live very uh, um, like you say engaged, and they want answers. They want. And in, they want the guidance and they want something to debate. Now, regarding American writers, well, you know, uh, we do have many who have uh, um, um, constructed, you know, not systematically the way Yoshua does it in these kind of four level of levels of signification, specifically with the historiosophic level, but Faulkner does that. Yeah, I yeah. mean, if you, if you think especially of the sound and the fury, there is the allegorical level, there's the collapse of the South. It's very much a historical political situation as well as psycho psychological and these concepts. When does that happen? When does that uh, novel take place? During Easter, during, uh, you know, they go to church. Uh, where is that? So it's, it, you find it definitely in, 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 in Faulkner, you find it in Melville, Mm. That kind of uh, multidimensionality, although again I say not systematically in the way that Yoshua is very organized, so he figures out how to do these things in a certain systematic uh, structured way. We have uh, Michael Chabon, who is uh, your uh, Californian compatriot, also yeah. does this kind of you know, multi-layered, suggestive, uh, political, historical, psychological, so um, there, are, there are such American writers too. I, I think she, he would love to 
have the stature that uh, Yehoshua has in Israeli society uh, here in American society. But um, I, in, I don't know, it, it, it might change um, here as I think as our society is changing its relation to you know, sort of the, 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 the political stakes of, of everyday life. Um, so I'll, I'll end with, uh, or it doesn't have to end, it depends uh, on the answer, but uh, one last question had to do with, you know, in this period, late 70s, early 80s, Yehoshua, and he was writing also essays about uh, the fear of a possible civil war in Israel. And so what um, is his opinion now of the polarization in, in Israeli society today? Um, you know, does he fear that same level or worse of, um, you know, the possibility of, of, you know, if not an open civil war, but some sort of rupture to that degree in, in society today? I don't know that there's the fear of an open civil war, but there is the, sec the specter of Tisha B'Av, the specter of the fall of, you know, the sovereignty uh, of, of the people uh, in ancient times. And I've asked him, Bully, do you ever read Josephus? Mm -hmm. We actually have a civil war. No, no, he says Josephus doesn't interest me. I have to ask him again. Oh, sometimes when you ask, then he starts to, but you know, so th that there is a specter there. He is more, is more engaged with the problem of these children who, who you know, like the, the, the sacrifice or the buying, the, just that to, to create a world where the children will be thriving and safe, all the children. So that, um, um, and all the vulnerable people, the foreign workers, you know, the people who have a lower income and so forth. He's he's a socialist from that point of view. Um, this is civil war as such. Where there there is this wrestling with fundamentalism on the part of Muslims, on the part of Christians, and on the part of Jews. And he has taken upon himself this wrestling. Yeah, it's, and, and it go to going back to the title of your talk, uh, Wrestling with Redemption. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it is refreshing to uh, a view, that even if it's at this point, you say the most tragic kind of moment is in his latest novel, that there is throughout the novels, even by pointing out its failures, you're uh, still an insistence on this possibility of wrestling with redemption and, and that there is, a, and also a view of redemption that isn't the traditional, you know, the Mashiach comes and the Jews win kind of redemption at all, but rather a very pluralist form of redemption and um, inclusive and- um, mm -hmm, Exactly, he wants to redefine that not helpful idea of, of uh, divine redemption to redefine it in personal terms of, uh, you know, rede repair yourself psychologically and construct good relations with the other. That for him is redemption. Wow, I think that's a perfect point to end on. So I'd like to thank you, Dr. Yael Halavi Weiss, and thank you for sharing uh, your presentation and, and your book. And uh, once again, the book is titled The Retrospective Imagination of A.B. Yehoshua. And I'd like to thank again the Nazarian Center, the Center for Jewish Studies, and the Department of Comparative Literature for hosting this event. And the event will be um, uh, put on YouTube in the coming days uh, or on the, on the center's website. And, um, and so if you know anyone who's interested who missed it, um, you can be able to send them the link. And uh, I think with that, we will close. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I wish everyone a speedy resolution of our pandemic. Yeah.